Visit aprofessionalafrica.com today to receive your certification from MindEdge. So everyone, thank you so much for tuning in uh, to our webinar today on funding uh, renewable energy projects. We are with uh, Monica Madoekwe <clears throat> today, who is the founder of Put True Technologies. We'll be hearing a lot more about it. She's also, she also works for the ECOAS um, or ECRI, ECOAS Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency. Um, so we're gonna be talking to her more about uh, what she does with um, <clears throat> ECRI as well as her new company. And we're gonna be learning a lot today about how to improve your chances of getting uh, funding. Um, I, I know of different people who've tried to apply for, for funds. Um, some have gotten um, funding and some haven't. So it's always good to know what did, you know, what did one person do right versus what the other person uh, did wrong. Um, and so uh, I would like to, for those who don't know me, my name is Uwe Naonyewuchi. Um, I have a PhD in electrical engineering with a specialization in asset management of power systems. So that's basically um, a way of saying, doing statist statistical and stochastic models um, of failures of equipment, um, life cycle costing, scenario analysis, uh, failure analysis, reliability, and so on of uh, power assets. Um, I also uh, work in the power quality and energy management field. So this topic today is very, very uh, interesting to me, interesting to me, and I know very important. Uh, the, the US for sure over the next few years will be, um, will get even stronger in renewable energy um, so uh, Monica is working in like the best field right now. Um, and so it's awesome to have her here. Let's see. Um, I was going to, as I mentioned before, I'm going to ask you a few questions because we're going to be sharing this video with um, some high school students here in the U.S. as well as in Nigeria and eventually other parts of Africa. Uh, but there are certain things I wanted to ask you um, just because, you know, types of questions that are at the minds of young girls trying to get into STEM or um, and for parents who are trying to figure out what, what, what areas they should kind of nudge their children towards. So um, I'll start with the one light question first. Um, is your job, at least pre-COVID, is, is your job a high travel job? Like, have you got, gotten to visit lots of African countries with um, ECRI or is it mostly in Cape Verde and then um, you do like remote calls to the other countries? Um, actually, my job involves a lot of traveling and it's not just across West Africa, like Africa, North America, Asia. So we do a lot of traveling and it's, it can be very, um, can be very difficult, you know, juggling travels and work yes. and just having a life. But yeah, yeah, it's also fun. So, I mean, before I started working at ECRI, I was looking forward to a job that will allow me to travel a lot. Yes. And I got that full, fully from ECRI. So <laughs> it's, been, it's been a great experience. That's awesome. Yeah, then may I ask you, you, know, you? Sorry, go ahead. I say, I mean, learning new cultures, you know, languages and everything. Is yes. 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 I think that's the most beautiful part of traveling. Okay. I was going to say, can I ask you what your favorite three countries are? Um, we have a little bit of a connection issue, but we'll, we'll work around it. That's fine. Okay. My favorite countries... Uh, yeah. How many do you want me to name? Three. Top three. Okay. Sierra Leone. I love Sierra Leone. And the Gambia. I guess most of them will be in West Africa. Wow. Um, yes. I mean, those are very interesting countries. Very beautiful. The natural resources there. You know, greenery is amazing. So, my... Uh, Last uh, one I'll say is, I like Liberia. <laughs> I love okay. Liberia as well. Okay, that's great. Um, yeah, that's, that's interesting. 
here, I haven't been to those West African countries, but two of my good friends have been, and they, you know, the pictures they shared from the from from both of three of those the, the countries um, were so beautiful. Uh, I, I think I know before I left Nigeria to you know, pursue my career and um, academic and stuff in the U.S. I never thought of, you know, Africa. I mean, I just thought of it like in terms of Nigeria and the places I've been to in Nigeria. But there's like so much in terms of tourism, so much to do um, around the rest of Africa. So it's amazing that those are your three, top three countries. Um, how has COVID-19 affected your travels? Actually, I've not been traveling much. Uh, when the, at the height of the, well, the issues, the lockdowns. Um, the ECOWAS Commission told all staff to stop traveling. The president of the ECOWAS Commission told all staff to okay. stop traveling. And we had to work from home. So it hasn't been much traveling. It's just uh, now that the lockdowns have eased up a bit that um, we're able to travel. But even for missions, we are told it has to be critical for you to travel. So, oh, well, that's all good. That that we are now in, yeah yeah Go so ahead. lots of remote calls like zoom zoom and windows meetings and so on or teams it's a lot it's a lot yeah. i was reading a, an article from mackenzie that you know shows that we are working a lot we are working more we are attending more meetings thanks to the whole you know digital um well zoom transformation so yeah it's, it is happening everywhere yeah yeah and i it's going to be interesting to see what they um find about work-life balance from people working from home that's going to be an interesting um uh research at, at, you know I, I can't wait for them to put that one out because i'm sure that that balance is pretty low at this point okay let's see second mm -hmm. question what shaped your academic pursuits, your choice of bachelor's degree, your certificates, master's uh, degree, and so on? Okay, so believe it or not, like I was, when I was growing up, like when I was in secondary school, I sort of, I mean, it sounds very funny, but I've just been interested in development, rural development, mm. mostly. And, um, I chose STEM, like I was in science, I chose science in my secondary school. But I also had a very deep love for economics and um, oh. I was actually the economics prefect in secondary school, even though I was a science student. So um, that was funny. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, I'm in science, but still, you know, playing a lot with economics and my passion was rural development. I didn't know how I wanted to to um, go about it because even though we had a counselor then, I I haven't said I took advantage of that. So, well, we'd have you know my dad who's a medical doctor but also very involved in rural development. Um, okay. We thought that perhaps going to Puto study agriculture will be a good um, you know path to follow. So. While studying agriculture and natural resources, rural development, I think that was a period where things like climate change, you know, environmental sustainability, started, it was becoming very, well, it was new, very new, but it was developing. And after my, my bachelor's, um, I spent, during my service, I spent a lot of time, you know, blogging about environmental sustainability and all that and from then you know working with my with my dad and also working with um well those who were very knowledgeable in the sector i applied for my master's energy studies uh, specializing in energy and environment and while as i was finishing i got into ECRI that's ECOA center for enabled energy and energy efficiency to continue the same path it, did they recruit you at your university or or because a lot of people want to work in development but don't know how to get into like into an ECOWAS or a USAID or whatever how did they recruit you um while in school we had a lot of internship opportunities so like while you're you have um 
advert from the UN, from ECOWAS, you know, just announcing that there, there's this internship opportunity. And there was that one from ECRI. Okay. I applied, I got in. Just as I was finishing, I went to Cape Verde. And after my internship, I uh, became a staff. Congratulations. Yeah, that's so awesome. Straightforward. Yeah, that's, a, that's a, um, a, a very good success story. And thank you for that for that uh, response. That's very helpful. Uh, so you, you transitioned into working full time from an, from an internship, which um, I know in the US, for instance, like, uh, like GE and some other big companies do internships. And that's when they are checking out um, your, you know, our work skills or whatever to determine whether or not they will keep, you know, hire you on um, afterwards. So it's kind of like a season of, um, you know, matchmaking to see if you would be a good fit for them and then if they would be a good fit for you. Uh, let's see, you've answered the third question actually, which was on ECRI. Um, now, what advice would you give young girls thinking of getting into energy and STEM? And can you tell us a little bit also about what ECRI uh, does? Well, for girls that want to get into uh, STEM, science courses are very interesting. And I'll say do not like limit your focus because the main thing is to have a passion, like what you really, um, if, I, if I look back at where, where I was in secondary school, I knew I just wanted, you know, I was passionate about development, but I wasn't very, very sure, like all the, you know, channels I had to yes. go through uh, to yes. achieve that. But look at where I am now, I'm quite happy with where, where you know, where I've come from. So I think the main thing is to have a, a passion. Once you have a passion, and you're sure this is something that is going to, you know, last for a very long time. Just, just know that every all the courses you're taking are going to, you know, give you the skills, the the training to to meet those passions. So the main thing is your passion. Like yeah. if you were to look at the certificates and degrees I have, it's quite diverse, you know. So I have yes. my BTEC in agri, I have my yeah. MIT in energy studies. I also have uh, certifications in project finance, you know, renewable energy. Negotiations. Diverse. <laughs> Negotiations, you know, all that. And I'm still doing more. So yeah. at the end of the day, I'm just looking for, you know, the tools that can help me achieve my passion. The main thing has been my passion. And then for, I really think that we need more women in STEM because your education sort of helps you to get into those kind of jobs. And STEM jobs do pay better than most other jobs, you know, um, generally. So I think women should not feel threatened or you know, to feel like, okay, perhaps this is not, there, there are many things you can do in STEM. You know, there are many things yeah. you can do in STEM. I do um, think that working, at, working for uh, ECRI for me has been very fulfilling. So I would say go for it. Thank you. And um, one of the things that we always say with Professional Africa, uh, uh, which is uh, the platform on which we're hosting this webinar, is never stop learning. So for you, you keep getting certificates and certificates, you know, um, to get better at the things that you do. And that's the same for me um, as well. Like right now, I'm taking, working on a certification in, uh, um, cloud, you know, cloud, as, as a cloud practitioner and understanding, um, uh, how data is stored and analyzed and processed and all of that in the cloud, um, and even though I, I, my background is power. So like Monica just said, um, you know, for, for those watching and for the young girls, you, you never stop learning. Um, you never know where you're going to uh, apply uh, you know, something that you learned in college, you're going to learn in college or you learn in college or um, even in secondary school. Just, just things just happen and then you kind of pick for more wealth of knowledge and um, create solutions. So let's actually, let's jump into uh, true Technologies. Why did you start it? Um, and, and as we answer this, I'm going to also open up your presentation. But how, tell us, tell us a little bit about um, your company and how or why you decided to, to start, to start it. Okay. First of all, uh, is there feedback when I speak? Because the network is not very strong. 
No, it's fine. It's some, it's just a little bit of a delay, but eventually comes uh, comes in. But it's it's fine. Okay. So, um, Puchu, I never thought I I will move into the private sector. I never thought I would want to start something. I always thought that my role in life was to work like in an institution like ECRI, to you know create the enabling environment for those who like to do business to do business. Um, however, you know, being in, in such an amazing job, you get to see um, the opportunities. You get to see the opportunities to actually do better in terms of achieving your goals. You know, my goals to contribute to Africa's development. And you also find a niche. You see a place that perhaps a large institution like ECOWAS may not be able to be um, successful in because of the bureaucracy and you know the way it's formed but a, an institution a smaller you know person with the skills and knowledge of how things work might actually be able to be successful in that small niche so just being there I just thought okay do you know what I want to do more and I don't want to be restrained or constrained by you know the the mandate of, of ECOWAS or you know any other big institution I could have worked with. So um, for me, Putru is just an opportunity to push, you know, to, to push the envelope, to, to really widen my horizon, to, to do more towards uh, achieving my career goals of contributing significantly to Africa's development. Very ambitious, but that's me for you. So <laughs> yeah. I just realized I'm on mute. Um, thank you so much for that. Uh, again, you are very inspiring, um, uh, young STEM, um, you know, expert. And definitely, uh, I know that what hearing you speak and watching you would inspire girls, you know, all over the world. So I'm going to share your my screen. And um, if you at any point have any issues with seeing it, then the slides, please let me know. But right now, okay. And let me see yep. if I can get it in slideshow. Okay. All right. So this is, um, yeah, I can see it very well. So I, yeah, exactly. This is um, a brief on put through. Um, for those listening, it's um, just basically to let you know that we got incorporated in 2017. So that is a long time from where we are now. We just went live uh, on 29th of October. And the reason for this is because we had to do a lot of work, a lot of market research, a lot of, you know, just digging deep to find out how this product could really move the needle in terms of solving a critical issue in Africa. And um, Putru is a FinTech platform but not like every other fintech most people are aware of in Africa, which are like payment gateways. Uh, Putru's main um, reason for existing is to um, make it easy for privately held companies to access uh, the capital market. And we will see why, why this is so. And we, uh, we, we cover the 40, uh, 54 countries in Africa. And looking at where the gap is, the investment gap, you know, how huge it is, we do estimate that we can uh, facilitate about um, $5.5 billion over a five-year period to help close the huge investment gap we have in the energy sector. Next slide. And for those wondering, that icon in the, in the first slide is actually the bridge. Putru's slogan is that we are your bridge to closing that energy deal. That's why we have the icon. Go ahead, Rena. So these are just the quick features of the digital platform. It makes it easy for parties to connect, to interact on the platform. And also we as Putru, you know, not just me and the people, the faces you see, but Putru is working on establishing a, a whole ecosystem of you know, the different parties that make deals happen. And 
through um, online and offline processes, we provide value added advisory support to make sure that African energy companies are able to package themselves well in order to you know, get investors, financiers interested in their project and businesses, but not just that, to actually make sure that deals are closed at the end of the day. Next slide. So I won't be talking very much about food through because as I mentioned, we, we, are, we, went, we just went like some few weeks back. I think uh, now I'll be wearing my hat, the ECRI hat, which I've been in for close to 10 years now. And my role has been focused on, you know, really helping to create, you know, the enabling environment, but also the, the market for renewable energy products and technologies. And, well, I'll be speaking very much about our West African experience, which is basically what ECRI has been doing since ECRI became operational in 2010. Now, ECRI has been working on four key resort areas, and the first one is policy, obviously, for good reasons. Policy, investment, promotion, and business development, that's number two. We have capacity building, number three, and we have advocacy and awareness raising as number four. So those are four key areas. But if you could pick just two key things that ECRI has been very actively involved, it would be these two things, regional policies, and investment promotion and business development. So ECRI has uh, developed four regional policies that have you know, been adopted by the heads of states. These are the renewable energy policy, the energy efficiency policy, the bioenergy policy, and the gender and energy policy. Um, my personal favorite, actually. So, um, our key goals have been to, you know, increase the penetration of renewable energy in uh, the region. We foresee that um, perhaps by 2030, we could able to have, we should have uh, over 40%, uh, including large hydro uh, renewable energy being used. And um, excluding large hydro, we are aiming for 19% by 2030. So in the frame of this, uh, very ambitious targets. We've been very, very actively involved in, you know, investment promotion. So ECRI has done this through um, establishing and administering small grant facilities. We have a number of small grant facilities. We have one focused on mini grids and, you know, uh, kind of different kinds of uh, renewable energy technologies in general. We have the one focused on gender and energy which specifically to support women on businesses to assess, assess grants. And very recently, we just launched one uh, to address uh, COVID situations in certain countries. So um, in addition to these grant facilities, ECRI is also very actively involved in organizing regional forums. We actually have a virtual forum going on this week. And we're also, you know, building capacities, developing projects for, you know, GEF funding, that's the Global Environment Facility funding, and also other DFI funding for member, member states. Um, these two things generally is just to make it possible for investment to, to happen in the renewable energy sector. Go ahead, Raymond. So at any point, you could ask questions, right? If you if you would like to chip in, feel free to do that. Sure. Thank so, you. Um, well, okay. So ECRI's uh, activities mostly target local SME. These are people who are drawn uh, by the interventions we implement. These are those who want to, you know, assess grants. They want to uh, participate in whatever activities that is doing. And the characteristics of this local SMEs is that most of them are fairly new in the market. So for example, if you look at the, the phase, the business cycle, the phase where these businesses are, you'll see that they are mostly at the startup phase or the introductory phase. These are new businesses. And perhaps uh, at this point, you find out that um, if you were to look at their cash flows, they mostly have uh, negative or very low 
um, operating cash flows and they have um, negative investment cash flows. And uh, if you look at the financing cash flows, you will see very large fluctuations in this. So these are what uh, banks use to determine, you know, where in the business cycle those companies are. And also you find out that most of them have very burden, you know, very, well, I wouldn't want to say mature, but the managerial experience isn't deep. So perhaps in companies like, you know, some of these SMEs, you see they have very competent CEO, but the rest are perhaps family members. And um, this usually is not very attractive. So banks or financial institutions want to see uh, a very strong, competent managerial team. Then you mostly find that they have small teams, which is okay. I mean, these are very small companies. They don't have a lot of cash to throw about. So they might have small teams and maybe some members of their teams will not be full staff. These are temporary staff. And this, this could make, um, well, the business not look the most attractive. And based on these characteristics, you tend to see that local SMEs, these are, what I mean by local SMEs, these are SMEs in the continent, on the continent tend to have, face certain barriers. And some of these barriers include inadequate financing and you know, lack of access to capital markets, that's debt or equity, private debt or equity, lack of technical um, expertise. Um, as I mentioned, you know, when you look at the managerial team, and of course, lack of access to technology and equipment. Monica, I'd like Next. to ask a question, please. Um, uh, sometime in the past, I had, uh, I had companies or people reaching out uh, with interest to fund um, energy projects in Africa. And one of the things that, that they put in there was that the banks would have to, they would have to um, have, the, the companies would have to have a guarantor or a sovereign, I can't remember the exact terminology, but um, you know, when I reached out to some of the companies in Nigeria that were looking for funding, they a lot of them said that banks don't do that for for you know their companies and that they would have to be a way around it. Can you talk a little bit about um, you know do, do 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 banks in Africa do they serve as guarantors? Or, uh, do they at any point in time open open themselves up to say? I'll vouch for or co um, cover this company. Well, they have special institutions that provide guarantees. So like, for example, the African Guarantee Fund and you have the MIGA, but those are both very large projects. And um, definitely it is a thing in the sense that commercial banks will want to um, ask for collateral. They'll ask for collateral or the so that is one of the terms is do face this a lot. But if you have a very strong cash flow, very strong, they won't have to, they they might not need any external uh, to if you were to talk to you know this, this group of fairly new um, in the market in energy companies, the deputies will need to provide collateral and I'll, I'll come to that. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I'll move to the next slide. Next slide. Now, so um, this is just, this shows the directions we are moving towards, um, not just ECRI, but a lot of institutions that so far have been trying to stimulate the environment, the investment climate for renewable energy technologies. So we are very much focused on grants because, I mean, we all know that renewable energy, they do have a, a social or public good, you know, um, element tied to them. And there's, it's widely known that they might not be able to compete with conventional energy technologies, even though the price of, like, for example, solar is really going down fast. So there is still the need, you know, to provide grants to stimulate the market. So this has been happening, as I mentioned, ECRI has quite a number of grant facilities. 
However, we are also experimenting with, you know, gradually moving towards fully market-based. This is where um, there are no supports, no grants available. You, you, you as a company, you are credit worthy, you are commercially viable, and you go to the bank and the bank sees your cash flows. They see that you have very strong financial results and they are willing to give you money. So these are perhaps examples, you know, the, the other companies in Nigeria you spoke to that the banks are not asking for those things. Those are very strong banks, um, companies. They can stand on their own. Their sales are doing, they have high, you know, profits. So for bank, for companies like that, you know, you, you are the one in control of the negotiation with the bank, actually. However, for those um, smaller sized energy companies that are at the startup stage and um, they do need a lot of grant, we are, we've been seeing how we can move into a quasi market based um, situation with them. This is to say that we provide um, support to, to, to prepare their projects. So for example, there's um, a project we just completed with the AFDB where we, where we received grants to conduct um, feasibility studies to show that those projects that will be led by um, private sectors are very viable projects with great um, internal rates of return, you know, amazing MPVs, and they check the boxes and everything. So we've done that, and um, this, these projects were, were done without you know, the, the private sector actually putting any money in. So now that the, the, the projects show, you know, results show that these are good projects, the next stage now is for the company to go and raise money, you know, from banks. So this is what I mean by quasi market-based approach. This is where we are at, the, at this moment. And we are hoping that with time, we'll move to a fully market-based approach. Next slide. Now, lessons from the market sounding, specifically for this project I mentioned, um, we found out that for small size projects, these are projects less than $1 million, and in some cases less than $5 million, they are not considered attractive to our local financial institutions. So how we found this out was that we did um, a financial roadshow. We met with several banks uh, commercial institutions in four of you know the largest economies in West Africa. These are uh, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Senegal, and Nigeria. And the plan, the the motive was to you know speak with them about this um, financial plans we had developed. You know, they, they, it was an opportunity for the banks to meet with the private sector. You know, the project sponsors of this uh, the project we had uh, conducted the feasibility study on. And um, so we saw that for those amounts, anything less than those amounts, it wasn't attractive at all to the banks. In fact, some banks were not willing to even meet for projects less than $5 million. I think mo most of the local SMEs uh, that we've met who are trying to respond will probably, you know, experience this, will know about this. And the funny thing is that even if you were to come up with a project of $10 million, okay, that would get the banks wanting to hear. But if they were to start looking at your financial statements, like your cash flow, and, you know, they compare that to what you're asking for, uh, the debt amount you're asking for, and it's significantly different. Like, for example, your cash flow is very, very low. Uh, some banks will say, if you're asking for, you should not ask for anything um, uh, less than 30% of your, your, your balance sheet. So if, if they look at that and it's very, it's very different, the banks will not want to lend. Now, they might not lend, especially if you don't have a collateral attached to it. There's no guarantee attached to, to that project from some other institution. The banks will want to listen. So in this case, um, from the market sounding, we saw that project bonding is something that is very interesting because 
having small projects here and there with small, you know, less than $1 million, these are not attractive. But if you're able to bring different parties together to bundle the projects, increase the size of, of you know, the, the project amount, this is something that is interesting. Then we found out that um, with credit enhancements, these are guarantees and lines of credit, banks will be more willing to lend to SMEs. Now, lines of credits are perhaps developed by, um, established by DFIs. For example, the World Bank could have um, a certain line of credit uh, just focused on local SMEs in the energy sector. So having those kind of things in place will reduce um, um, the, well, the risks attached to your project and banks perhaps will be willing to lend at um, a lower interest rate or at least the rates negotiated with the DFI. So some people, if uh, commercial banks are not interested in $1 million projects, maybe uh, microfinance institutions would be interested in that. But we also know that microfinance institutions, they have very high interest rates. So those are some of the trade-offs you need to consider. Question, Monica. Um, some of the companies um, or the, the startups have their ideas all fleshed out. Um, they've done feasibility studies. They have, you know, their projected profits and expenses for the year and year, you know, forecasting into the future. Um, and they don't have a million dollars. They don't even have up to five hundred thousand dollars to fund their projects. Um, so with the banks not willing to fund the small size projects, um, are you saying uh, like going to the world banks and microfinance uh, financing banks would be their solution to just get started in the first place? Because that's a tough, that's a tough one. Um, I think, yeah, I think startups should not be too quick to go for loans. It's just going to drown you when you need to pay back. Sometimes the it's just it's not it's not the best strategy for for you really you need to look at your own equity contribution like what can you do you know with your own with your team can you get grants can you apply for grants can you raise the money yourself and um don't be too quick to go and borrow money it's not it's not easy for you but if for example you are you know like i talked about um you know bundling projects so for example we have a lot of continental agencies looking at how to increase the participation of SMEs, local SMEs in SPB projects. Uh, that special purpose vehicle uh, project does develop just to, sorry, uh, campaign is developed just to carry out a project. Those are some of the ways you could start. But frankly, I would say don't go for loans immediately. Um, repayment might, might drown you. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, very helpful. I'm going to move to the next slide. Yeah. So this this is where we are going in terms of uh, the strategic level trends. Um, for 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 example, you know, I talked about the the market sounding that we did through F3. Um, we now are working on a phase two of that specific project. And what we are doing now is to, we just launched a, a call to recruit a transaction advisory uh, team that will help us to, you know, identify uh, businesses and that small SMEs, work with them to, you know, package the projects they have, bundle them or find a suitable project structure that will be interesting enough to get some kind of funding, either from IF, um, IFIs, IFIs or others. But we are moving now towards, um, well, larger size projects away from small projects because most financial institutions will tell you that, you know, the amount of time they spend on due diligence for a small project is the same they will spend for a large size project. And there is really no much incentive to spend all their resources analyzing a small size project when you can, you know, focus on large size projects. So, Small size projects have very, very 
discouraging. And um, the more you're able to work with different partners. So, for example, you talked about being a startup. That's good. But if you can find a more um, experienced, matured company to partner with, then increases your chances of, you know, working together on a project because that other company has, you know, very good financial track records. So you could be implementing a certain part of that project and that, you know, that company knows that you're definitely good for, you know, what you say you can do in terms of your capacity to deliver. So if that um, more matured company will be taking all the risks. You know, they'll be the ones provide, uh, providing their documents to the banks and, and assuring the bank that indeed they can, you know, pay back when it's time to pay back. So we need to look at more opportunities for partnerships uh, within, for example, African countries, but also North-South collaboration and just trying very much to see how you can bond the project. You know, different small SMEs coming together to apply for a certain project, you know, large size project, it increases your know, chances of actually walking into the door of a financial institution when you're talking about big money. So that's it. that's it, the trend now because from ECRI, but not just ECRI, DFIs who have certain grants for project preparation. The ultimate goal of project preparation is financial close. But sometimes when you look at the number of projects that have gone through project preparation and those that have finally gone through, have achieved financial close, it's significantly less. And this is not encouraging to the donor who is giving the money for you know, the study. So we need to look at it, a way to increase the number of projects actually uh, achieving financial close. And I think over time there'll be there will be, a, you know, we already have uh, a interest in small projects, but you, you're going to see that more happening now, especially as a free money becomes tighter. Process. So I think at the end of my slide, I'm looking forward to the questions. Great. Great. Thank, Thank you so, you much, so Monica. much, Monica. This, this is, is very, very, very helpful, helpful, very insightful for me. For me. Um, this, this is pretty amazing. amazing. And, and uh, thank, thank you for answering some questions from, 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 you know, number one, one uh, small, small company is not, 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 not getting it all so early. early. Um, and how that mess you all up. And, and um, the uh, advice to look for companies, bigger companies, partner with, you know, that already have the, you know, the, the, the grants can already be taught us, um, even if they don't they know don't your small, small company yet. yet. Uh, that, that also, I think, they would also help with giving, giving the small companies, companies um, uh, additional experience, experience and, and, and help, help with their, their as, as, as you said, financial flows. So let's, let's see. see, I think we, we have... Uh, okay. okay, someone, someone asked, asked that room door questions. Yes, yes. We, always, we, always we always do questions at the end. end. Uh, Jim, 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 Jim son, if you are still, still online, online, let me uh, let me see if you're online and I can just share your ask my questions directly. Uh, okay, okay. Jim, Jim, uh, Mr. Shishi. We can hear you clearly. Um, can you type your question in the chat room just in case uh, your the connection is not good and I can ask it for you? But let's see. Feel free to turn on your video and, and ask your question. If, if it st stays on Claire, I will ask it for you. Just put it in the chat room. Meanwhile, the, if anybody else has any questions, um, please put it in the chat room or indicate so that I can give you the opportunity to ask. Okay, so we'll just give a couple of minutes here. Um, uh, I guess I can ask a question while we're waiting. Um, uh, Monica, how much do, does the uh, AFDB work with um, ECRI uh, in terms of the 
to scale up projects or whatever that you do together. You are on mute. Let me. You're muted, Monica. I don't need to be on mute. Okay, it's perfect. Uh, how about this? And okay. Uh, well, the AFDB is one of our, our core partners. We we have uh, well, some of the core partners are the Spanish Development Agency. Uh, we have Austria. We have AFDB. We have, of course, the Coas Commission that you know provides most of the funds for our programs and admin costs as well. So we do a lot of projects with the AFDB. A lot. And um, I'm very happy to say that, you know, this, the financing plan project is definitely one of my favorite projects, not because I'm managing that project, but um, because of the impact, you know, the, the impact of the project, being able to, um, to help um, SMEs, you know, local SMEs to become sustainable in terms of being able to attract funding themselves to move away from grants to actually be able to get pri other private sector interested in their business. I think that is just the way forward because grant money keeps on reducing, it come, it's getting more difficult. And if you're a for-profit uh, business, you should not really dwell so much on grants. You need to have a very strong business strategy that you know can generate money in order for it to be sustainable. So is it, does Equi or is this part of the plan um, that Equi has like to create more uh, like exhibitions or events uh, where um, financiers can meet with 